Good morning, everyone. It is uh, December 13th, 2022. It's another opportunity for me to go through this slideshow. I have a booked engagement on January 29th where I'll present this perhaps in piecemeal and maybe not the whole thing. We'll see. But I want to practice that and also just remind people, if you've not seen this before, let me say that a different way. I'm hoping to make a slideshow like this change a little bit in culture as to what you can do with it sort of by default, which is you can deliver the same talk. You can use the same slides. Like, I like to think of how when I was growing up, a lot of uh, folk music was happening. You know, um, Bob Dylan, let's say, Joan Baez, but also <clears throat> just compilations of folk songs handed down, like worker songs, minor protest songs, minor as in mining, gold mining, and, you know, folk songs, right? So there was um, a populous, popular, uh, po what do you call it? Like ordinary folks, right? Working class, I don't know what you want to call it, the folk. The folk would, would learn these songs, and the people who were good at guitar would bring their guitar and they would teach each other and you know they would have this egalitarian you weren't ripping off a song you were there was a transmission occurring people who knew a song would share it with others and it, it wasn't like one person knew it all and everyone else learned necessarily it was a swap meet of songs and i'm saying that when you use these slides you could treat them as you would a folk song, and I sing it from time to time in my Bob Dylan-y way, let's say, and people say, well, Kirby couldn't sing. Kirby didn't really make full use of blah, blah. And you could take these slides in another direction and sort of develop them. But I'm trying to make this spread so that it's not just this slideshow that we treat like that. It's like, let's make this PowerPoint genre, you could call it. These are not PowerPoint slides. These are Google uh, Earth slides. I'm going to go to the end of the slideshow as I talk, bounce at the bottom, and then come backwards. And that's when I'm actually going to throw in more details about how I would say you, as a guitar player, could use this slide deck yourself. Actually, I'll start doing that right with this slide and say the overall arc is you build up attention with your audience, especially around is this stuff crazy or useful? It's like that's quite a dichotomy there because crazy is often the epitome, epitome of not useful. To the person who's crazy, they may be making a lot of sense to themselves, but it's what we'd call a private language. There's no way to really penetrate it, and there's no way this person can really be a team player with that crazy talk. Or maybe there is, in which case they're functional, in which case, like with Bucky, he is very functional. He fit in. He did well for himself. Then there's that tension. How does that work out? What is that? Where crazy is making sense. How does that work? So there's a tension there, and it's especially high in the world of mathematics because we don't think you can get away with BS in math. Like, there's a right way to reason, and we can spot fraud easily. So if Bucky was a snake oil salesman, as many would claim, we should be able to get to the fraud quickly in the math that he presents to us. But there's really nothing here that seems to be fraudulent, but nor are there any original or new claims, other than in the caption here, he seems to be questioning somehow uh, what is it what is it the unity is taken not from the cube edge but from the edge of one of the two tetra the structure is fine proportionality exactly known to us is not required in nature's structuring well so what I, what's my phone want to say all right Leela Vam Lindsay Walker for those who uh, follow my blogs used to be a housemaid here introduced me to Food Not Bombs. She's the character in my Food Not Bombs video who talks about, who I talk about making a cool bike for me. She's on her way through uh, San Francisco from Tokyo, from India, from Kathmandu right now. So that Texas, she's in the immigration line in San Francisco. She'll be here just for a quick visit and 
in a few weeks, a couple weeks or something. So you set up a tension, and like she could take this back to Nepal, for example, and uh, with her other stuff. So there's a tension set up, maybe around parts have no existence, but otherwise this picture doesn't seem to say much. But in your narrative, so here's where you're comprehending, it's like you have to comprehend what you're talking about to some degree. But you know, as a student of synergetics, that this cube as here depicted has a volume of three, which it couldn't have in ordinary XYZ math that we all learn, because with an edge being like this, second root of two, we know height times width times base is what you do with a cube to get its volume. You multiply those three dimensions, height, width, base, and we say, or height, width, breadth, height, height, it's not height, height, width, breadth, that's how we spell them, right? So height is more like the word eight. Anyway, those are the three, so-called three dimensions. They're at 90 degrees to each other, which we call linearly independent or just independent dimensions. Like you can vary in one dimension and not in the other two. I'm going to turn off this volume on this thing, though. Now where are all those bits? Some new messages. I shouldn't try to do slideshows when I have my phone right here and it's making a lot of noise. I've seen that happen on other people's thing too. Okay. So volume three in synergetics, how can that be? So we're setting up attention here. And I get to a resolution really quickly. First I have to explain how this too can be related to sphere packing and how at alternate corners of this cube where you see the thick lined tetrahedron drawn into it, those corners are where we would put the balls of our CCP, cubic closest packing, FCC, face centered cubic. Both these acronyms mention the word cube, cubic, and they predate, predate synergetics. They come to Bucky from uh, his heritage. CCP, FCC. But remember, this guy dropped out of Harvard or was expelled or whatever. Partly, I think, in retrospect, he was just not going to fit with the grain of Western thought because West is very, very, very committed to specific thinking patterns. And he was going to be an anti-pattern. He was going to go against a lot of stuff. He has a maverick by nature. And I think he was figuring out over his lifespan how much of a maverick he really was. Quite quite a big one. He started to realize that too. Like he had no idea at first how exceptional he was. Kind of in getting along, really. He was very gregarious. And this is what conundrum early in his career. He's like, I like Al Capone. I'm paraphrasing. He never said it like that. But it's like, I hang out with all these gangsters who are running against prohibition. You know, they're supplying alcohol to a lot of people. I like alcohol. This is me paraphrasing Bucky. I totally understand the criminal side of life. Like organized crime makes total sense to me. But on the other hand, these, these people who are prosecuting crime and are fighting back and want the world to be free of alcohol and men who don't come home and beat their women and spend all their money on, on booze. I understand them too. I totally do. I'm married. You know, I'm conflicted. I'm going to give up alcohol eventually. He did, by the way, eventually. But, you know, he admired Gurdjieff because they would have these drinking parties. <laughs> Alan Watts liked to drink. I've cut back on beer a lot, but I haven't uh, denied myself one glass of wine or two now and then. I'm going to skip the brandy rum with the eggnog this winter, though, because I don't need any more pounds. So how might this tetrahedron serve as unit volume? Well, it can't in a way because if the volume is, okay, here's what people need to remember. It's long been proved, it's total fact, that this tetrahedron inscribed in a cube, and actually you can stretch it, you can make it more flexible than just a cube in the theorem, but let's just take it, uh, start with a cube as this special case of a more general truth. This tetrahedron will have a volume one-third that of the cube, okay? 
Well, now that's not a Bucky thing that he proved. So we would really like this tetrahedron. The question is, how might this tetrahedron serve as unit volume? Did I say the cube as the unit volume? No, tetrahedron. The cube couldn't serve as unit volume either, not this one, because it's too big. It's second root of two on an edge, so it's got a big volume. But we could shrink it to one by one by one, then we're back to the sugar cube of our of our fantasies. We're back into the Western philosophy, Greek metaphysics, and so on. But if we wanted to go with the fuller way of doing it, we would say that this tetrahedron has a volume of one because of that theorem, one-third the volume of the cube it inscribes in. The tetrahedron has one-third the volume of the cube it inscribes in. So that tetrahedron is really what we want to get to as having volume one. And the way to think of it again is in a sphere packing context. You want to not lose the connection between the spheres and the cube. Okay, so I'm going to speed up again. But this, before I speed up, is basically how we're going to fix this problem. How are we going to have a unit volume tetrahedron? You're going to multiply the three edges of a tetrahedron together. And this is where, okay, so you're giving my slides. It's not really my slides anymore. It's like I'm a folk guy who wrote this slideshow and you're singing it. You should abet your, your use of my slides on the side with whatever additional slides you think are missing or that you would like to provide. And maybe not just slides, maybe animations or whatever. So you're chugging along with the recognized known quantity, Kirby slides, these slides. And you're jumping off to the side sometimes, which is what I just did, jumping off to what I would call uh, augmentary materials, complementary materials. And I basically want to show the multiplication scheme again. And I've been here many times. For those of you who watch my channel, I'm always coming back to this picture by David Kosky here. But this is how we multiply 2 times 2 times 5. If you count the segments 1, 2, 2, and 5, and the volume's the same as always. 2 times 2 times 5 is 20, right? No special math needed. It's the arithmetic of your, of your childhood. But the picture is different. The volume we're looking at, this encased tetrahedron, we close the lid after we go out 2, 2, and 5. We take those endpoints, connect them together, and put a lid on it, you could say, and it's the volume of this internal tetrahedron, or this smaller tetrahedron, as shown in the context of a bigger one, that has the volume 20. But the unit of volume here is the tetrahedron, the little tetrahedron, right? And that's the answer to the question. We've got another model. So if that's going to be your model of how to multiply, if you're going to move into that world, where 3 to the third power is a tetrahedron and not a cube. You know how we always say cubed? When you see that little exponent 3 next to a number, you're supposed to say cubed without thinking, really. That means you're well-trained academically. You have been through the Western brainwashing. Your brain has been soaked in it, steeped in it. And you say squared and cubed for second power and third power completely without thought at this point. It's a total knee-jerk thing. But it sounds smart. Sounds like you went through school, which you did. So, whoa, it's good. You get positive reinforcement, like a Pavlovian dog. So Fuller comes along, and he's a maverick. He's going against the grain. And he's actually going to dare to attack, you could say. Question, challenge, put resistance up against what we consider absolutely obvious, which is that space is three-dimensional, height with breadth, duh, 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 right? And then maybe time is a fourth dimension, or you can add more spatial dimensions. These are two ways to go. Time is the fourth dimension, Einstein. More uh, spatial dimensions is what we call extended Euclideanism. But to take that the space that we live in, the everyday space, and say that is 4D because a tetrahedron is the minimum conceptual volume and it radiates in fours, four faces, four, like even the dual is a tetrahedron, four, four, everything's four, except edges are six. And there you can see where 3D comes from. You've got the zigzags, the two, three vector zigzags that make a tetrahedron. So as you draw the zigzag of a tetrahedron, you could say to yourself, height, or start with width, height, 
breadth or something like that. Say those three words, width, height, breadth. It's like three sword strikes in space that create room for the complementary zigzag, and the two together make four, the tetrahedron of four dimensions. So yeah, he'll do a language game where we say space is four dimensional. He's not saying you can't keep the language games you already have. We have this either or king of the hill stupidity in the West. I call it I call it the West by convention. I actually think it's more European and therefore East, right? Britain is in the East there with Russia, right? So one, four, six, three are the volumes you now get once you make this shift and treat the tetrahedron as your model of third powering. These are common polyhedrons that we kind of glance over in school at some point, maybe. They're usually in America, they'd be in the back of the book, uh, 10th grade geometry, and you'd never get there because it's hard to get through a book that thick, and the teacher doesn't expect you to. So polyhedron, bah, no one really studies them anyway. But to have something new to say about them at this late date, right, Fuller is publishing in the 1970s, and he's giving us a streamlined approach to volumes based on tetrahedron as his model of third powering of volume in general of space and whoa everything seems to simplify and you can share with kids and you can pour beans from one polyhedron to another and he's got glossy pictures published I think Synergetics Folio came out in Singapore but now it's in the back of Synergetics both these books were published head of um, some branch of the, the CIA. No, that wasn't a head of anything. Deputy Inspector General was a title at some point, I guess. His collaborator I'm talking about on the synergetics, right? He worked with a, uh, Ed Appleweight on that. Cosmic Fishing, we're reading it now at the Trim Tab Book Club and stuff like that. So A and B modules, this is part of the nomenclature that goes with synergetics. And here is where, you know, you might want to jump off to the side again. You have your own bag of tricks. What do I have about A and B modules in Martian math, for example? I could, you know, scroll up and down. And When you're giving your slideshow, my version and your version don't have to be identical. Though. That's the whole point. And there's more degrees of freedom when it comes to delivering like a slideshow than a folk song, I would say. Like you can do different things with a guitar and sing in a male voice, female voice, whatever different voices. We don't call them male and female. We call them baritone, soprano, whatever, alto, whatever. Key. There's all kinds of things in music theory that lets you do variations. But what is it to do variations in the spoken word? Well, we have poetry. But you're just supposed to read what's on the page. And even when you do Shakespeare, and I'm not saying I'm Shakespeare, I'm saying I'm providing this format of a slideshow. And I'm saying, well, when we get to this part of the A, B modules and how they make a mite, maybe you want to quick dive into an animation that shows mite, kite, right, and the space filling and the five tetrahedra and the Goldberg treatment of it and his families of... Uh, space filling polyhedra that he discovered like dive off into the Goldberg math right it's like there's whole areas of math that you could allude to and dive into at every juncture and then come back to synergetics it's kind of more like a backbone through it with these altered uh, axioms or high or he doesn't use all those you know Anthropologically, it's a difficult thing to say that synergetics is mathematics. It's easier, although it's mathematical. It contains content we'd call mathematical. I think it's more philosophical. And post-Wittgenstein, philosophical also means anthropological. But like where you turn it on yourself. Anthropology has a reputation for being ethnocentric and that there's one quiet ethnicity that's commenting out loud about a target ethnicity or about ethnicity in general, but it doesn't turn the camera back on itself very effectively. And when it does that, it turns into philosophy in some ways. So anthropology and philosophy are close together. So we're going to go through the modules, the A, B, T, and E modules. And I think the more conventional presentation of this slideshow would be to, you know, convey what these are. And how this fits into my story is, 
remember the initial tension. Can we actually have a unit volume tetrahedron to begin with um, and have nice edges for it too? I mean, obviously you can have a unit volume tetrahedron, but in XYZ Western math that we've all been brainwashed in, it can't have nice edges too. You can have a volume of one and irrational edges, or you can have nice edges and irrational volume, but you can't have both. The tetrahedron cannot have a nice treatment the way a cube can. That's what we all believe until we get to Bucky. And it's, no, no, no. We can throw all that out and start over and make it real nice with the tetrahedron, really comfortable, really nice whole numbers and stuff. And we've not seen that trick before because the cube controls the PR. We are creatures of the cube, right? And once you break out of that, then you want to prove that there are benefits. In other words, why would I struggle so hard against my own brainwashing for no reason? And we're saying, no, 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 not for no reason. There's a payoff. So in the middle of the slideshow, you're talking about A, B, T, the beast modules, B, E, A, S, T. You're kind of saying, look, all this stuff's pretty easy, makes a lot of sense. We're not doing high dimensional anything. This could be for kids, and yet it's novel, it's alien. Why? Because we've broken away from the Western paradigm. We're not thinking in English. We're not like Englishmen. Anyway, that's the East. England is part of Europe. They say they're not part of Europe, but culturally, they're always fighting the French. If you fight the French, that makes you half French. Anyone you fight habitually, that makes you somewhat them, right? So I don't fight the British. I just don't think of them as really the West, you know. But they want to be the West. They want to think of themselves as the West. So I will use the word West, like I say, when in Rome. But the West is also, I mean, Rome is also in the East. Italy, it's all part of the Eurasia. It's the Eastern Hemisphere is what I'm talking about. There's the Western Hemisphere, and then there's the Eastern Hemisphere, and then we have this political overlay where there's this thing called the West that wants to say, call itself the West, but it's really anchored in, the, in what I would call the East, right? So there's a namespace confusion, but they can both be right, and I'm using that kind of as an analogy, that we can both be right. We just have different ways of talking, and that's how synergetics gets to coexist with its different you know, way of treating the tetrahedron and the concentric hierarchy or the kind of, I think of them as Russian dolls. What is it called? Matryoshka? Matryoshka? A nested hierarchy, but hierarchy in the sense of things inside of things, right? So thanks for to Stroopy for helping me along those lines, get, get some new terminology going. Um, there's room for new terminology here. A lot of people don't like all this Greek stuff. This Western Greek metaphysics, the hedrons, the polys, all that. They want different language for all this. There's another folk song opportunity. Like you could use these slides and where I'm saying things like icasa and icosahedron, you can talk differently over top. As the narrator, you have a lot of control over the nomenclature. In fact, you don't have to speak in English at all. This could be a Russian or let's say Greek or Chinese speaker and they're showing these slides and people know enough English they can point things out and use the English but actually the narrator is not using English at all. I would encourage that. So CCP, FCC, Fuller felt obligated to come up with something besides an acronym that highlights cubicalness because his whole thing in getting away from the cube is king is to get away from the word cube and cubic as the most important words also. Orthogonal, orthodox, the orthogonality, or the orthodoxy of orthogonality, we use the word normal to mean 90 degrees as well. That is so ingrained, right? So he's into sphere packing. He gets credit from HSM Coxeter for this particular formula. If you look in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, Floor is mentioned. I mentioned two actually there in the link section. And Dr. Loeb, he's the other one who worked closely with Fuller on synergetics. They thought maybe it was going to be more of a collaboration on the text, but Fuller wanted so much to pioneer his own non-Western way of thinking that Loeb ended up just writing more like a prefix and a prologue or afterlog. 
different editions of Synergetics have more or less of, I guess they all have his. He's got some more conventional math as part of Synergetics. You'll find it in there if you look. And so that's how their collaboration worked out. But there was our bridge. He's an MIT crystallographer type, as well as a Renaissance man, polymath kind of guy. So we've had all the raw materials to integrate this stuff culturally, academically. It's like, I feel like the, the, the fuller side of the bargain has been fulfilled. It's like anything you could want. And now we have the new biography, 600 pages and so on. So more grist for their mill, more to talk about. So like if I'm a college president wanting to ask, is their faculty competent? Is their material competent? Does this have anything to do with our mission? As a college, I'm saying it's really too late to ask that question. The answer was in the 80s, of course. And now we're in the 2020s, and no one's done much with this stuff in colleges. I don't think we have any colleges, not really. Not really. I'm, it's just rhetoric now. It's like at this point, you're saying, oh, he's just being a polemicist. He's attacking colleges? What? No, of course, of course I'm just being facetious in a way. I'm on faculty. Let's put it that way. There's a lot of colleges, quote unquote, invisible colleges out there. And like the way you rise through the ranks or whatever and get higher up in a particular school is you accomplish certain feats, you could say. You show you can do X, Y, and Z. If you want to be a top ballerina, which would not be my aspiration personally, I couldn't do it. But if I wanted to, I would have to show off my, my moves. And in this world, what what my school says is, you got to present like a slideshow like this, even this very one, to advance, right, so that we all know you know what you're talking about. So take this as a good way to share your knowledge, make it part of your resume that you could sing this show, basically. You can star in this play. It's kind of like if you want to be an actor, it's great to have a Shakespeare play on your resume. So I'm saying get good enough at synergetics including this quadre stuff that comes later, after Fuller's died already. Uh, quadre coordinates, not my invention, but I, I took the ball and ran with it in terms of coding it in Python and stuff, and it's another way to say, hey, we have a language game, you have a language game, I can jump into XYZ anytime and teach conventional, regular, everyday math. The orthodoxy is not denied me. I don't have to sit out freezing cold as, as this heretic in a cave with the Bucky stuff. I can wander the halls of XYZ and Western civilization without being challenged. I got my name badge. I'm fine. But I can also burst into song about this other um, lineage by now, which thinks differently. And it's not verboten. It was. <clears throat> I used to call this verboten math. Now I call it more just plain old esoteric because no one knows about it hardly. But not forbidden, right? At this point, the floodgates have opened and this stuff is flooding out. I think there was a lot of namespace confusion, right, around synergetics because there was another author who took the word for his work and doesn't have any of this 4D stuff or whole number volumes. You know, it's like gone off on a tangent from our point of view. So that may have delayed some of the academic acceptance of this stuff. Anyway, we go back to our roots in geometry. We point out that the meaning of 4D was never just one unified meaning from the beginning. At most, it settled down to two meanings before Fuller. 4D in the sense of 3D plus time, and 4D in the sense of extended Euclideanism. And you can always tell a layperson who doesn't really get the math when they confuse those two. You know they think at the level of science fiction about this stuff. But they haven't really matured enough mathematically to see that Einstein's 4D and Coxer's 4D are not the same. So you can kind of test a person and see if they confuse those two, because they really often do. And then no, those folks would, it better to help them separate those two meanings before you say, oh, and by the way, Fuller comes along with his tetrahedron meaning of 4D, right? 
they don't want a third meeting when they already think there's only one meeting. So there's a lot of folks you can really help disabuse them of their confusion just by dwelling on the fact that 4D never just meant one thing to anybody in our culture. It's always been bouncing around. And Fuller enters this conversation like everyone else. And in the early 18 or early 1900s, there's a lot of ferment. There's a lot of like unsettled science around what 4D is going to mean. And he writes 4D time lock. He wants to be in on that. So he jumps in the game. He throws his hat in the ring. He, he gets to be friends with Einstein, strategic. He gets to publish a book with Einstein's blessing, which he wrote while drinking, back to the subject of booze and so on. But he's high on life. He's having a grand old time. And he does. He has a lot of fun in life after pretty much he decides not to sell out anymore or try to do what other people think he should do. No one's going to tell you to do what Bucky ended up doing. You, you're never going to have a boss that says, go out there and challenge three dimensions, right? you got to make that up yourself. And he did. And so, yeah, I've got some of the Martian math taken from those storyboards. Hopefully cartoons someday. This is a bad drawing of a a canyon where we're doing a, a dam, building a dam. But now that I look at it again, it really looks like that Damas cartoon. There's a, a YouTube channel, Damas, with this fable of the bridge and how they learned to finally just not fill in the whole chasm with rocks so they could get across. They only needed an arch to, to do the bridge and stuff like that. Ephemeralization. So in my cartoon, a little different, they're building a hydroelectric dam, which does need to go all the way across because it's trying to barricade the river behind it. So it's a different thing. Uh, but it's the Earthlings and the Martians doing a collaboration. And I have this whole science fiction where kind of ETs come to Earth and want to learn and help with the hydroelectric kind of industry. That's what's most fascinating to them. But they have a unit volume tetrahedron, and they might as well be thinking in synergetics the way it comes across to us. So our kids have to furiously understand synergetics so they can talk to the Martians and work with them. That's the cartoon, right? So we go on about that, and it's not like necessarily ethnocentric when we do that recruiting, by the way. It's like if we don't have any English speakers, that's not a problem, right? This is not about the English, right? This is not about Anglo culture, right? Because we're going to write that as completely XYZ. They are never going to get out of that. The XYZ height, width, and breadth, three-dimensionality of the earth, of the space, of space. Is, space is 3D and all that. If you're an English speaker, I'm very skeptical you will ever overcome that in your own thinking. It's, it's over for you. But there are other cultures and other thought uh, languages that I think will find synergetics more convenient and more congenial because they were never steeped in the dogmas to begin with. They haven't ruined their brains by thinking in English. Again, I'm being polemical, rhetorical. It's like, haha, that funny Kirby guy. I'm showing you uh, how Fuller got to his synergetics constant, which was for going back and forth between XYZ and IVM volumes using just a simple constant, which you would expect, right? It's not that hard, this stuff. This is high school and below. It's not super high level, and that's why I call it folk and why I think people can spread these slides. I can't explain everything in one slideshow. People would go to sleep, so I'm showing you the end result of what you can do with some study. So obviously, reading synergetics helps getting how these quotes fit in. Check out Escher. There's a whole story there in terms of could they have been collaborators at some point in the future. In other words, Loeb was trying to bring Escher and Fuller together to collaborate more. But there was already some karma there, and Escher ended up dying, so that relationship was somewhat curtailed. The evolution of the 4D brand, where that comes from, again, the whole trajectory of the 1900s. The meaning of 4D doesn't just settle, and it hasn't yet, up to now. It's like language is in ferment, and a lot of people think of math as a comfort because it never changes. It's a rock. 
And it's not true. It's a slowly morphing rock, if that's true. Rocks slowly morph. And math actually can change more quickly than, than we sometimes think. So then I, here's how I end, and this is kind of interesting. And to get the notes right here, to sing this part, would be difficult for some maybe, but you got to see synergetics as highly marginalized, way on the fringes, because the brainwashing has been so successful. People are so locked into their blockhead cube way of thinking, they're such squares, that there's no chance for most people in this generation to ever shake free of that. We've written that off, we know that's true, we can't help it. So for those of us who have enough mind left, to think clearly, and there aren't many of us, is our fate um, sealed? Like we're doomed to obscurity and so on, right? So how quixotic is synergetics is another way of saying uh, how much of a risk might it be to join forces with us? And the windmills, and Don Quixote, the, the, uh, I'm not a super expert, but there's the stereotype where Don Quixote's fighting windmills. And I would say windmills here could represent the establishment. They could represent that which we have been marginalized from. We're out in the cold and there's the establishment, right? Represented by windmills. And we're the Don Quixote's, right? But there's a twist here. For one thing, notice those have three blades. They're kind of triangular looking, which is kind of a sense of, whoa, wait, are they really on the other side? And then they come for us, right, in the next slide. And uh, there's Don Quixote, right, ready to face them. They're kind of scary. They look like tripods. In fact, this whole thing turns into H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, and these look like the Martians invading all over again. The windmills seem to have the upper hand. The Martians are here. And they seem to, uh-oh, I don't know about this coyote. I don't know if he's going to be able to stand against this or not. He looks pretty brave sitting there. But the punchline is we are the windmills. In other words, those of us who have a mind still and aren't brainwashed and in the box, those of us who can think outside the box, we are the windmills now. We have to power the planet, do some serious thinking and stuff. It's like it falls to us, or it's like by default... We're the establishment, we're the banks, we're grunge, we're all the evil, we, at least we're awake. We're not stuck in your dogmas, we don't say cubed and squared. If you think cubed and squared all the time, maybe you're just asleep in a Walt Whitman sense, right? So that will go backwards, so that kind of ends with the audience is kind of on edge. So you kind of leave them thinking, right, with that... Now, the polemics I use, the rhetoric I use, you don't have to use, or you can do it in your own way, right? But the point is to say synergetics is not that fringe. It's actually more core, because those of us who followed the fuller agenda, we understand there's still a lot of good work and hope and interesting future stuff coming from that corner. So we haven't turned our backs on it. And everyone else is just stuck in their dogmas where this flatworm, so stare at this a little while. That might help you snap out of it, right? All your cube thinking, all your 90 degree height, width, and breadth, spaces, 3D, all that stuff you've been taught since you're a kid. We're not that respectful sometimes. It's like, poor you. You still believe that crap they taught you? You believe that math? <laughs> anyway, that's the rhetoric. If you want to, right? If you want to get polemical, I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying there's enough here to be of interest to many different subcultures. So don't be too shy about who you want to share this with. And let's say I'm checking out tomorrow, let's say. I don't want these slides to just go to waste, right? So I'm giving permission ahead of time. I'm not here to supervise. I may not see your particular presentation ever. Like, you might do one and send it to me and say, hey, Kirby, what do you think? I did this. But, hey, I might not be around for getting all that feedback. So, part of my motivation. But then I want to extend it to everyone, right? I want to say, hey, uh, this slideshow thing we've come up with in this century, in the last 50 years or so since computers, everyone knows PowerPoint, Microsoft Office and stuff. Now I'm using Google Slides. 
But this whole genre of PowerPoint, we have this fixation that only the person who made the PowerPoint or someone close to them in the same company can give that deck presentation. And then it doesn't, it's, they're the only appropriate person. And once they're not doing it anymore, we have to make our own slides. We're not allowed to use their slides. And we have a whole different attitude towards folk music. In fact, you don't have to write any of your own songs to be considered a good folk musician. You're just singing the greats, right? So I'm saying slideshows, PowerPoints in our culture, in our minds, to keep them all from dying as the people who originally made them pass away. Let's learn how to pick up random slide deck out there and understand the topic well enough that you can say, okay, here's some slides from the late 1900s, like 1995. Someone did these slides. Here's my version, right? Provide overview and narration for someone else's slides. I'm saying we should do that to keep slides alive and not bury them in the coffin of the presenter always, right? So I'm trying to change the culture a little bit, and I'm doing it explicitly with regard to this particular slideshow, which I also narrate over and over in my YouTube channel in a different mood, in a different voice, trying to give examples, even though it's all me in this case, trying to give examples of how there's variations on the theme, right? And you're not really locked in. So I hope I've explained the general structure. There is going to be the tension of how do we make this cube be volume three, ergo the tetrahedron is unit volume, what's the payoff for doing so, and how do we resolve it, first of all, how do we make it work, and then is it worth making it work? Well, there's a payoff in terms of conceptuality. You get some nice, simple access to spatial geometry, I'd say, if you're an artist, engineer, here's a great gold mine streamlining concepts that will help you. And since we've been up to this for a while now, this is 40 years out from the publication of Synergetics, those of us who've been doing our homework now find that we are the windmills, right? We're the establishment. The rest of you just snoozed. You put yourself on autopilot and there you are. All right. Okay, so that again, that puts a little spin on it and you can put your own spin. But I just wanted to invite you guys now to follow that Google link there and um, grab these slides and start working on your version. And if you want to do a slideshow that you put out and say the same kind of stipulations, maybe I can take your slides and do my spin on someone else's slides, right? It's not a one-way street. So I'm looking for slideshows where people have explicitly said it's okay with them I have permission to use those, those slides and do my own thing. But, you know, people will be critical. They might say, well, you don't do it anywhere near as well as that guy did because you don't understand what you're talking about. So if I just grab random slides and try to, like, Andreas's slides from yesterday, if I just try to go through his stuff ad hoc, I'm going to sound very shallow because I don't understand it well enough. So I'm not saying it's all that easy to just jump in and do these slides overnight, but I'm saying it's a great guide. If your attitude is, I want to do these slides, I'm going to learn synergetics well enough that I can do these slides. That's focusing, right? It gives you a goal, just like learning how to do a certain piano song on the piano or ballet, do a certain dance. So here's an objective to attain, should make it feel like uh, within your range anyway. And I won't explain all these details this time. I do in other versions of this. So watch other versions and enjoy doing your homework and we'll talk. See you next time.